Hello and welcome to Heartlight Vedic Astrology. Uh, today I was going to go through uh, analysis for the full moon or Purnima that's coming up uh, tomorrow, 25th January 2024. This is from a Vedic Astrology or Jyotish perspective. And it seemed like the overall theme for this moment in time was feeling your way to better days. So let's take a look. Uh, just a note beforehand, the information presented here is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical, financial, professional, or life advice of any kind. If you are in need, please contact an appropriate professional for support. Then you might take a minute or two to read the rest of this disclaimer. If you're new to Vedic Astrology, Jyotish are my videos. All of my teaching videos on the subject are in my concepts playlist, so they can all be found there. And wherever you see a double asterisk in one of my talks, that means there's a teaching video on that subject, so you can find out more. Uh, there's a list here of some of the videos that will be helpful to uh, <clears throat> also see if you're not um, familiar with the information, especially if you're a beginner, because my interpretation videos tend to incorporate a lot of concepts, as you might imagine. So there is North, South, and East Indian style charts, intri introduction to navigating a birth chart, introduction to the constellations or Rashis, constellation or Rashi categories, <clears throat> planetary aspects, planetary exaltation and debilitation, natural benefic and malefic planets or Rahas, Arko Bhavanasha, uh, planet breaking house, uh, nakshatras or lunar mansions, Parivartana yoga or planetary is a planetary combination. Um, also, I have a full playlist on each of the planets, so you can see my planet Sargahas playlist if you're interested in the symbolism of a particular planet. And then also I have a growing list of um, uh, houses or bhavas videos in my houses bhavas playlist. And so if you're new to the houses and the symbolism of them, you probably want to start with the lugna, also known as the ascendant rising sign or first house. Alrighty. So here is the chart for this moment in time, and this moment in time is where I'm at. So uh, 25 January uh, 2024, this is going to be 12.53 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, the Day Lord at this time is Jupiter, and the Hora Lord or the Hour Lord is Moon. So already from that, I'm getting healing the mind or emotions. So again, you know, these sorts of... Uh, Bits of information about the time of the chart that we're analyzing uh, can give us some, again, sort of general overall feel. But the shot period, uh, so the planetary period at this moment of time, it's Saturn, Moon, Moon, Saturn. So that's kind of interesting right there. Um, so Saturn is a planet that indicates things like lays, obstacles. It's usually kind of a heavy energy planet. And the Moon is the mind and feelings and intuition. So feeling a lot of heaviness. Uh, again, for overall vibe here. Then uh, Saturn, Moon, Moon, Saturn is going to shift to Saturn, Moon, Mars on the 16th of February, so just a few weeks away. And at that time, uh, Mars will be exalted in Capricorn. So uh, uh, that's important, I think, as we'll see through the analysis. The Lugna Nakshatra, so the rising sign uh, lunar mansion, is Rohini. And Rohini is uh, symbolized by a cart, um, like an ox cart, but it's the energy of it is just beauty, art, attraction, like the most attractive. So there's a sense of like loveliness here. Okay. Um, and then the moon nakshatra is Pusha. So Pusha is symbolized by a cow's udder. So that uh, symbol is kind of uh, showing us like uh, a nurturing stability, is what you can get from that. So we have a little bit of a dichotomy here in terms of this heavy Saturn feeling, um, but then it looks like uh, there's some attempt here to ameliorate that. Okay, so hence the theme of the month or theme of this moment, um, feeling your way to better days. So, All right, so let's start at the top. Uh, the top square diamond here is the Lugna, also known as the Ascendant Rising Sign First House, all different names of the first thing. And we can see here with that little two in the corner, the two represents a second zodiac a sign or actually constellation Rashi of the zodiac, and uh, that is Taurus. So we have a Taurus rising, uh, Rishabha in Sanskrit, as it's known. And Taurus is a fixed earth or Stiraputvi sign. So right there, there's this kind of steadiness in that kind of sign because it's fixed and it's earth. So it's actually very grounded and practical and um, 
kind of material, like more of a 3D type of energy. Yeah. And then, as I mentioned, Rohini is the Lugna Nakshatra. So there's this, you know, when we combine that already, it's like, how do we create more beauty, more stability, more abundance? You know, like I often think of Rohini and Taurus as like a very much of like almost like a farming or gardening type energy. So, you know, we've got that um, in the Lugna. So that's going to sort of permeate the whole chart. Okay, so the Lugnatia, the ruling planet for the chart is Venus because Venus rules Taurus. And Venus is in Mula, uh, Nakshatra, and uh, Venus has gone to the eighth house. So what does that tell us? Well, Venus is a planet that represents things like art and abundance and socializing. So again, it's it's more of this, you know, you can see where Taurus and the Rohini um, energies are sort of, um, there's correlation here, yeah, or convergence here. Um, so, and then Mula though, um, and again, it's interesting, Mula is symbolized by a bunch of roots tied together. And Mula is, uh, that energy, it can be seen as a destructive energy um, because it's ruled by the deity um, uh, Kali, or a form of Kali, which is the goddess of destruction. But Mula, especially when you see those roots uh, tied together, you know it's it's about planting again. So um, there's planting seeds of Venus here um, of the things Venus represents. And it is destructive because, again, when you plant a seed in the ground, the, the seed has to go through a very transformative process, right? It has to kind of die to its original form as a seed to become a plant that's rooted in the ground that, you know, hopefully evolves into shoots and leaves and maybe flowers or vegetables or fruits or whatever. Um, but the thing is, you know, not all seeds survive that process because it's a fairly arduous process for that little seed to, like, you know, grow through the ground, you know, and break up through the soil. And there has to be enough water, nutrition, that sort of thing. So it's a little bit of a precarious position, but there is, I think, um, you know, at least there's hope there potentially for something new to develop. Yeah. Um, and then the eighth house is a moksha stana. So a moksha stana is a house of, of freedom and liberation. So again, we're our, we're getting more of this kind of energy of like, how are we going to, like planting seeds, how are we going to plant seeds of, of beauty and kindness and compassion to make things better for this moment. Okay. And uh, Venus is conjoined here with Mercury and Mars. They're both in Purva Shada. So Mercury is a planet that represents uh, thoughts and uh, logic and analysis and communication, uh, education. And Mars represents things like innovation, action, uh, and what else? Um, Starting, starting new things. So again, there's this like again energy of starting something new here, or a decision to start something new. Purvashada then Akshatra is symbolized by a winnowing basket. So there's this like basket where you put raw wheat and you shake the basket, and then the hulls uh, fall off the wheat. The part, so the inedible part separates from the edible part. So even though, so again, it's this kind of like planting or thinking about planting or deciding about planting that sort of thing so i don't know how much planting has actually been done here um of this venus energy but there's this process of thinking about it um in terms of how do we um, plant new seeds to improve the situation the eighth house also represents deep psychology and venus since it's the uh, a ruling planet for the whole chart. It's like, how do we not only plant seeds for this moment in time of, of beauty and goodness and maybe our environment? Uh, because again, this is, you know, it's Taurus, it's something practical. But even the self, how do we plant seeds for a new self that are going to grow into more beauty, more compassion, more abundance, and that sort of thing? Okay. So again, I don't know how much has been done. But there's a sort of sorting process going on. Now, once we switch from Saturn, Moon, Moon, Saturn to Saturn, Moon, Mars, and Mars is going to be is is going to switch up here into Capricorn, then that's when a lot of the you know then that's when the real action might really be taking place. Like here, it's more of an internal, deep internal processing and action that's going on. 
but I think action, the real you know, outward action, obvious outward action is coming up once uh, we switch uh, the Sha planetary period. So again, if we're, you know, bringing this all together, so somebody who's deep in thought, if this was a person, a Taurus person, and they're considering how to bring beauty, art, abundance of self, communications, actions, and even daily routine, because Venus is the lord of the sixth house of daily routines. Yeah, so it just might be simple things like, how do you create like a morning practice or evening practice or a meditation practice or... You have some sort of flow through your day because, again, that's going to be a practical, that's a way to kind of ground uh, this kind of practical energy of bringing beauty to the everyday. Like I think of um, Japanese culture a lot where it's like, um, you know, there's sort of this Zen uh, thought, uh, you know, that permeates a lot of Japanese culture and it's about kind of simplicity. But it's kind of like, if you've ever watched shows on how they manufacture things in Japan, there's so much thought that goes into it. Like every little teacup, every little rice bowl, every little chopstick. Um, and so even though people's homes may be simple, every detail is well thought out, well planned, well designed. And so it brings beauty to every day because again, you know, you're drinking, you know, and especially if you live in Japan, you're probably drinking tea and eating rice every day. But how do you elevate that very common mundane experience to make it more transcendent really? And so that's the energy I'm getting here. Um, there may be though um, a clash between thoughts and actions because you can see Mercury and Mars are um, almost within a degree of each other. So they're actually moving into planetary war the day after this full moon. And so again, Mercury represents the mind, its decisions, logic, analysis, communication, and Mars represents action. So for a little bit of time, right after this full moon, it's like, which way are we going to go here? What seeds? You know, again, it's more of this decision-making time. You know, if you have 20 different seeds or 50 different seeds, how do you choose the five of those to again focus your efforts and be a little bit more practical um yeah and so uh i do have a video on planetary war also known as graha yuda if you're interested in that uh to find out more about that um so let's go through the other houses here so again that's just all coming from the lugna and already giving you a lot of energy insight into this chart and where again if this was a person where somebody's at, or again, if this is a moment in time, what sort of sifting through, um, you know, energetically for this person. So again, it looks like a lot of deep contemplation. So uh, again, this is a North Indian style chart. In North Indian style charts, you count houses counterclockwise. So you kind of go up and to the left to find the second house. And here it's a Gemini. And you have in here, um, aspecting the second house, Venus, Mercury, and Mars coming from the eighth house, but you also have Jupiter. So Mars and Jupiter are in a parivartana. They're in a, um, oh, I failed to mention that. I, I had it in the notes, up, up, but I didn't mention it. So there's a parivartana between Jupiter and Mars, and Jupiter happens to be in a Shwini nakshatra. Shwini nakshatra has this energy of kind of help and rescue and being first, and especially Jupiter being the great benefic. There's this kind of like rescuing type energy here. And so you can swap with the Parivartana exchange of houses, you can swap Jupiter and Mars um, in their placement. So that means you can bring Jupiter to the eighth house, which would be nice because Jupiter is going to be in its own house in the, in the eighth house. So uh, there's going to be even more kind of benefic, spiritual... Um, thoughtful wisdom energy, intuitive energy coming to all this decision making and, and you know, uh, sifting through ideas and actions and stuff um, in the eighth house. Um, but if you bring Jupiter into the eighth house, that also means that it's going to aspect its energy into the second house. So you can see all these areas coming from the eighth house to the second house. So we have Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter all aspecting in the second house. That's going to be a lot of energy going to the second house matters, such as family and such as money. So very kind of, again, earthy type matters because the second house is a, a artistana. So it's a house of wealth. So 
a lot of energy here. The other thing is the second house represents communications, especially oral communication. So there may actually be a sorting through of communications between this Taurus person and their partner, spouse, spouse-like partner. Um, and again, Venus, uh, Venus is not only the Lugnatia and the ruling sign of the Taurus person, if this is a birth chart we're looking at, or at this moment of time, but Venus is also the Karaka or symbol for a partner, like a spouse, spouse-like partner. And it's gone to the eighth house. The eighth house is considered to be a negative house, so there may be, I was picking up, there may be a little bit of trouble here with the relationship, if somebody's in a relationship. Um, especially with Mars there, um, you have Venus and Mars together, so, you know, that's romance uh, and potentially sex life and stuff like that, especially since it's the eighth house. The eighth house are, is a, kind of a place that represents, again, deep psychology, but things that are also a little bit hidden because the natural uh, constellation or zodiac sign for the eighth house or uh, in Scorpio, which is kind of a hidden can be kind of a hidden secretive type energy. Um, so there might be some arguments going on here. Um, uh, yeah, and again, not only is Venus, uh, because it's ruling Taurus, there, there's that Mula energy of planting seats for the Taurus person, but Venus is also linked to the seventh house of partner and spouse, because Venus is the Karaka, the planet, the uh, the planet re that represents spouse. So both the native as well as their partner are going through some sort of transformation here, and the two of them are probably talking about sifting through ideas of what to think and what to do and what decisions need to be made. Um, so there might be some. I don't think it's a knock down, drag out, blow out fight, especially when you have Jupiter coming back here to the uh, Sagittarius ruled uh, eighth house. But there's some going back and forth, uh, and it may not seem like there's a lot of traction or actual decisions or actions being taken yet. It's just kind of sifting through, um, but looks like there's a lot of energy there. So it might even be something like, how do we bring some spice back to the relationship? especially since Venus and Mars are there. Um, it, things might heat up in the discussion, though, when Mercury and Mars are in planetary war on, what is it, I think the next day, 26th, 27th. So there might be a little bit of a spike here. Um, and again, you have to bring all this energy back to your own chart. So again, if somebody has a very um, strong or chaotic, um, uh, Venus, Mars, that sort of thing. Um, there could potentially be some harsh words being spoken here. Um, but again, with the Jupiter coming back, um, it looks like there's going to be some edge that's taken off or intensity. It's going to ameliorate some of the intensity that might pop up because of the planetary war. Um, but again, also focus on the family. All right, so then the third house we see here, there's moon, it's swa, it's in its own house, and it's full. So that's a lot of energy, uh, and it's also in, um, uh, for the moon, and the moon, again, symbolizes things like intuition and imagination and nurturing. And it's also in pusha, nakshatra, which I mentioned, is a very uh, stabilizing, nurturing energy. So I think, and the third house also represents things like um, siblings, but it also represents written communications. So um, what else is here? We do have an aspect from sun, from the ninth house. Sun is in Shravana Nakshatra. Shravana is symbolized um, by three footsteps or also an ear. So there's a lot of listening here. So a lot of supportive listening uh, we can get. And also Mars is also aspecting from the eighth house here. Um, as well as the uh, 12th house when you swap uh, Jupiter and Mars. So uh, Sun and Mars are a lot of fire energy. So there can, again, be some heat here with communication, especially written communication, like maybe text or email. Um, and also Sun and Mars represent the leadership planet. So Sun is like president or a king, and Mars is like commander-in-chief or um, uh, CEO, that sort of thing. So even though there's some supportive energy here and listening here, um, you know, again, we're like sorting through, like, how are we going to lead us forward um, 
uh, through to better times, to more nurturing time, you know, uh, more s stabilized, nurturing, um, harmonious time, uh, you know, more hospitable time. Um, the thing that was in Mars aspects into Cancer, where the moon is, Mars is uh, debilitated in Cancer. So that's going to bring some instability even to the communication here. So again, it's a little bit, um, uh, how would I say? And that's the thing is even like sun, you know, sun, even though it's a leadership planet and a fire planet, it's, it's listening, like it's active listening, but it's not necessarily doing much. And, um, you know, where it could be in another nakshatra, like if sun was in Ashwini, it's like, whoo, go, you know, all, all, all engines go, you know, all, all systems go type of energy. And Mars is in this like winnowing back and forth. So again, even though there's some attempt to lead forward, I'm not sure. I'm not seeing that there's a lot of, you know, traction uh, and forward movement yet. But again, that's probably going to shift once we shift into that Saturn Moon Mars period, uh, February 16th, and Mars is in, um, uh, what is it? Mars is going to be in um, Capricorn where it's exalted. So even though it's still going to be aspecting into Cancer, it's it's going to be coming from a place of greater strength. And also, once um, at least once it's initially crosses over into Capricorn, it's going to be in Uttra Shada which is a victory. It's, it's a nakshatra that indicates victory as well as a piercing, strong, powerful victory. So again, I think the energy is going to shift once Mars, especially once Mars shifts into Capricorn, and then we shift a, a planetary period, or at least the antra, the sub-period. Yeah. Um, anything else here? So again, a lot of nurturing energy, emotional stability, intuition, imagining. So in a, a striving towards that, um, how much we actually get there, I'm not really sure. And again, this uh, debilitated Mars, it may be intermittent. So there might be discussions and then, you know, it kind of dies down and you talk some more and dies down. <laughs> um, but also like, um, I think a sibling that can be very supportive is indicated here. <clears throat> um, let's see, fourth house. So now we're getting into, we're going to see some of the Saturn energy. And Saturn's, again, important because it's the Mahadasha, it's the main planetary period. Um, so again, the moon and all this nurturing energy is important. And, and then so, on. so the fourth house we have is aspected by Jupiter. So this Ashwini rescuing Jupiter. <laughs> but it's also aspected by Saturn, which is in Shatabisha. And Saturn is in its own sign. So Saturn is super strong. And stronger, I would say... Well, Jupiter temporarily, the Saturn is on Jupiter, so Saturn is going to create some drag on Jupiter and all the, you know, beautiful, benefic things Jupiter represents. <laughs> and Shatibisha is translated as a hundred healers. Um, so uh, Saturn and Shatibisha may mean uh, medical issues or issues that are difficult to ameliorate or solve. And so that's shining into the fourth house. The fourth house represents things like mother. And it also represents things like home. It also represents things like happiness. So again, just from the kind of Panchang data, right? The day lord is Jupiter, but the Cha period is Saturn. You know, there's this, again, kind of a, a little bit of a war, not like a planetary war, but there's some um, juxtaposition between the Jupiter area, uh, Jupiter energy and the Saturn energy here. Um, so this may indicate that there's issues with mom, home, also education, like especially like undergraduate education is represented by the fourth house. Um, and just, again, just general happiness, you know. So again, I think there's this kind of, you know, adds, adds into or correlates with the other energy that's presenting itself, that there's an attempt to, there's some sort of difficulty here and there's an attempt to see how, um, things can be improved in whatever corners or areas things can be improved. Then the fifth house here, uh, we have Chitra, uh, K K2 and Chitra. K2 is an explosive energy. It can also represent like a distance or separation energy. And Chitra is like a, it's symbolized by a gemstone. So it's kind of like architecture, structure, you know, the facets of a gemstone. And the sixth house, excuse me, the fifth house represents things like children. Um, and the Karka, the symbol, the planet that represents children is uh, Jupiter, and it's in the 12th house. 
So I was kind of seeing here that the ch children may be absent or, or away, or um, and it might just be that they're back in school again, because, you know, kids are back in school now, or maybe feeling a bit distant, um, was what I was getting here with children. And then the sixth house here, we have aspected by Mars and Jupiter. And again, the sixth house represents like new routines. Uh, the Lord of the sixth house is Venus. So again, that Mula planting new seeds. So it's it might be, again, just trying to get into some sort of nice flow of a routine. Um, because Jupiter, when you have Mars and Jupiter together, um, it can also represent legal issues. And the sixth house can represent legal issues. So there might be some legal issues uh, that are... Uh, coming up here uh, for somebody so <clears throat> which might be adding you know that might be uh, um, part of what this person is contemplating because Jupiter and Mars are not only aspecting into the sixth house of legal issues but we have Mars in the eighth house of this deep contemplation and Jupiter with the Parivartan is here as well so that may be part of what uh, the person's attempting to ameliorate um, Uh, basically, same information except on the right. You have the well, my notes on the other houses. So the seventh house uh, is aspected by Mars and Saturn. When you have Mars and Saturn together, you get uh, energy like workaholic, athletes, uh, engineers, and uh, so. Uh, and the thing is, uh, Mars uh, Mars is aspecting into the seventh house when you swap uh, Jupiter and Mars. So it's uh, if you sw if you put Mars in the twelfth house, you'll get Mars aspecting back into a Scorpio here. That'll bring strength to the partner. Also, the seventh house can represent independent business. So, but the partner is going to be in engineering mode, like endurance, overworking. Um, can also be, and the partner can be experiencing health issues because of the Saturn show to be shown. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like the Taurus person and the Scorpio person have two very different approaches to this moment in time. Taurus is feeling their way through it, trying to be nurturing and supportive and listening and all of this, and planting new seeds of beauty and art and abundance. But the Scorpio person, I think, is just, you know, you know, just putting it in fifth gear and just, you know, running, running as fast as they can to try to ameliorate, you know, in more of like a practical, structured, you know, way. Uh, so their modes of operation are quite different here. Um, the other thing is, uh, if we're looking at where Mars has gone from the seventh house, it's gone to the second house from Scorpio. So um, a Scorpio person has gone towards the house representing family and money, right? So again, taking care of practical matters. So again, very grounded, very practical here. Um, <laughs> then the eighth house I've talked a bit about already uh, with this Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter combination, you know, healing relationship issues through communications, trying to figure out what to say through the sorting energy. I think it generally it's a well-meaning uh, energy here, but there can be a lot of overthinking. I mean, you have uh, Mars here, that's a lot of energy. Jupiter, when you do the Parivartan, is here. Um, you know, the, the Sagittarius sign is a fire sign, energy. Mercury's here. So there's, and just the number of planets here, there's a lot of energy. So there might be some overthinking and almost like analysis paralysis type thing going on. But, you know, the overall thoughts are about how we plant seeds of compassion. It could also be, again, sorting through sexual issues between the partners. <laughs> and it could also represent medically things like uh, issues with lower GI. Um, like I was kind of getting from this, like maybe a IBS, uh, irritable, bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, that sort of thing. Because especially with uh, mercury there... <laughs> You know, that's going to be a uh, peripheral nerves. Uh, Venus can be OB, OB gyne type stuff. Uh, Mars can be um, like uh, bleeding muscles, that sort of thing. So I was almost getting like issues with peristalsis, um, that sort of thing. So I, I was kind of seeing mostly GI issues. It could also be urology issues um, or even like prostate, that sort of thing, like the deep hidden structures of the sexual system. Um, <clears throat> there could be issues there. 
But because Jupiter's coming back to that house, it's going to protect it a bit. So I think there might be some health issues here. Um, the 10th house, um, uh, we have sun here. Uh, sun uh, in the 9th house gives us a Karko Bhavanasha. So that uh, usually indicates things like difficulty with uh, father here because uh, the sun represents father and the ninth house represents father. So it's almost like too much father energy. Not necessarily that the poorest person has issues with the father, but the father may have their own issues, like health issues, especially because the lord of the ninth house is this massive Saturn in its own sign in Shatibisha. So uh, dad or some other authority, maybe even the boss, uh, your boss uh, has uh, um, health issues right now. And that's what's kind of bringing down this whole situation. Because again, the Saturn in Shatabisha in its own sign, that's a massive Saturn. And Saturn is going to be in Shatabisha for the rest of the year. So it's kind of a, it's going to be a more of a marathon than a sprint here. Yeah. And again, that's why this Taurus person whose natural proclivity is to, you know, how do we make things better and how do we ground things? You know, whatever this um, situation is, it's um, it's going to take some, you know, mental and emotional endurance, looks like. All right. Uh, let's see. And we have... Um, the 10th house here, we have Saturn again, a massive Saturn. So definitely troubles at work. Uh, the other thing is Saturn is aspecting in the 7th house. So it looks like troubles at work generally because you have this massive Saturn in the 10th house, which is like more of like 9 to 5 type career. You have Saturn aspecting into the 7th house, which is independent business. And then you have the Sun, Karko Bhavanasha, and the, um, <clears throat> what is it, the um, ninth house, which can represent like government work. So almost every corner representing career is challenged here. So it looks like there's troubles at work. Um, 11th house, you have Rahu and Revati, aspected by Jupiter. So there's going to be a lot of energy here because Rahu is an ambition planet and Mars is, you know, uh, energy and initiative and stuff like that. And the 11th house represents things like income, socializing, groups, clubs, also risk-taking, um, so it looks like uh, there might be some attempted action here um, in terms of like generating income uh, if there uh, um, if there are money issues, uh, but also like socializing because again this is a Venus person ruled person and Venus is all about socializing and that sort of thing. So, um, but the thing is, this might be a bit of a wild goose chase because Rahu is a you know, it's a shadow planet, so it brings this energy of um, mm, uh, things that are hidden, unusual, unexpected. And Mars is, you know, this initiative, but Mars is not the most consistent planet, so it's going to be a little bit of a weave, I think. But at least uh, Rahu, and Rahu, uh, so there might be energy here, but it's kind of a... Again, another nakshatra of like soft, you know, supportive energy is like Revati. Revati is all about like hospitality. So it's, even though there's action here, it's the kind of action where it's like soft <laughs> and supportive as opposed to like a real fire, sharp, pointed, laser like focus, you know, hold no prisoner type action. So again, it's just, it seems like this person is more thinking, contemplating, holding space, that sort of thing, rather than really, you know, pushing forward and, and, and really, um, you know, um, hurtling over high bars here. Um, yeah. Um, and then the 12th house, we have Jupiter and also Mars, if we think about the Parivartana. Jupiter represents... Um, <clears throat> children, uh, but also Mars represents siblings. So children and, and uh, siblings can be traveling or there can be issues there um, because, again, the 12th house is a house of loss um, and expense. So there might be some expenses there. Um, it can also be with Jupiter there and Mars there because Mars when, when Mars comes uh, to its own house in the 12th house, that's going to help relieve uh, losses like material losses but it won't necessarily 
help the people represented. So the living beings represented. So there might be some, there could also be lost because I mentioned like uh, Jupiter and Mars together can represent legal issues. So there might be some legal issues here. Um, uh, but it could also be like loss of income because Jupiter is the Lord of the 11th house of income and it's gone to the 12th house. So there might be loss of income due to medical issues, which I think makes more sense. And I think the legal issues might be related to the medical issues because again, at least in the States, when you go in, like, you know, they have you sign all this paperwork saying that you're financially responsible for any bills and the bills can add up, you know, pretty fast. Um, so that might be the legal trouble is that the medical bills, um, because again, if this is a long, you know, haul here, um, that can add up um, pretty easily, I think. Um, and also the Jupiter in the uh, 12th house, it can also represent, I think, with Mars there as well, it can also represent like initiatives to, um, you know, isolate or visit like temples or churches or something like that, because uh, the twelfth house also represents places of isolation, like a temple or a church or a hospital. So, um, yeah. So again, all of this is you know, there's a lot of thinking and holding space, but I don't know how much is actually externally being accomplished outwardly. But again, you have to kind of you know make up your mind about things before you can you know start really pursuing a direction. So that's a general energy from the main chart, um, but let's look at the subcharts, uh, the amshas or divisional charts to get a little more uh, nuance here to all of this. Okay, so uh, here are the subzodiacs. Um, so let's look at relationships first, the people involved. So just as a reminder, the Disha sequence is up here. So currently in Saturn, moon, moon, Saturn, at the time of this uh, full moon. Excuse me. Um, and then I switched to Saturn, moon, Mars on February 16th. So again, the Amshas are used primarily for timing, um, but you can get some additional information uh, to bring uh, to bear or to integrate with the primary chart. Yeah. So I've circled the planets here of the Dasha. So I've circled Saturn, Moon, Mars, uh, in each of the charts, so you can see them. And this chart, the top chart here is the Navamsha D9, which represents spouse or uh, it's kind of general energy strength of the main chart. Um, I did also circle Venus. Um, the reason why is that in the ninth, in the subzodiac D9, when you have Venus and uh, Lugna, um, that can indicate issues with spouse. Because it's the Venus again is kind of the Jiva Karaka, the planet that represents the living being, and it's kind of this. Um, it's not a Karko Bhavanasha like you do in the natal chart, but um, when you have like Venus and the D nine at the top, that's almost like a Karko Bhavanasha because it's the same kind of deal where you have too much energy between the planet representing the spouse or partner and the not the bhava or the house but the subzodiac so um this does correlate with the primary chart where i said it looks like there are going to be issues with spouse here um so saturn is not well placed it is swa so that's nice um but um it may mean that the partner's feeling really stuck um and having um, at least there's some strength here, but, um, and again, there's that, um, in the main chart that Saturn, Mars, like this person's going gangbusters trying to, you know, help situation in their own way, in a different way, in a different style than the Taurus person, right? The Scorpio person. But, um, you know, this massive Saturn in the eighth house here, there's a lot on this person's mind regarding responsibilities and that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah. um, Let's see. And so Saturn is also the Lord of the ninth house here, plus Rahu. So again, that ambition. So there may be a lot of focus for the spouse on the father for medical reasons. Because <clears throat> again, Saturn is in Shatabisha on the primary chart. Um, there is, even though Venus is in the Lugna here, there is a Parivartana exchange of houses between Venus and Mercury. So that's going to help a bit 
but still there's this, you know, trace or, you know, um, there's some energy here that there's difficulty to the spouse. Um, and then moon is in the fifth house of counseling <clears throat> and advice. So I think uh, the moon, again, like what it's trying to do in the primary chart, there's trying to bring some uh, shift in the mental space because, again, you have Mercury here and moon. So Mercury is the logical mind and moon is the intuitive mind and Mars here is like new initiatives. Yeah. Plus we're bringing, you can bring Venus into that fifth house through the Parivartana. So again, it's, it's, it's almost like... Um, I think the partner may be feeling more stuck, whereas the uh, you know the Scorpio partner person might be feeling more stuck if there's a partner involved here, um, and more practical because Saturn is in Capricorn here, so Capricorn is an Earth sign. Um, but you can see that there's some attempt with shifting the mindset here. So again, that may be part of why there's so much of that winnowing communication energy that's a bit intermittent because again, I think the Taurus and Scorpio person are coming from two different places, but they're actually wanting the same thing. So it's just going to take them a little while to, I think, get an agreement. Um, but once, uh, since Mars is in a positive house, um, I think that's going to help things um, once we get into the Mars Antra sub-period because... Um, there's going to be a new initiative with counseling and advice here in the fifth house. Um, and also Mars is going to aspect into this, you know, um, I, I want to say concrete, you know, Saturn in, in Capricorn, it's like a pretty heavy duty energy. So with Mars there, there's going to be some new initiative, fire, you know, fire in the belly, um, rather than just feeling stuck or sunk or something like that. I think it's going to help. But again, this is going to be a long-term situation here because uh, the Saturn period is a long period. So, you know, how are, how are we going to, you know, the spouse is also thinking about how to make this better. Um, then if we look at the next chart, we have the Draken ID3. This is about siblings here. Um, this is interesting to me because this chart looked very similar to the main chart. Like you have Saturn in the 10th house. You have Sun. You have a Karko Bhavanash in the 9th house. Um, Jupiter, Mars in the 12th house, Moon in the 3rd house. There's a lot of similarities here. Um, so Saturn's well-placed, which is good because Saturn, you know, this is a long Mahadasha planetary period. But it is in um, uh, Mishra Sankhya uh, with Venus. So that's going to give us some um, mixed results there. Um, the other thing is that uh, Saturn is on the 7th house. So spouse, it's on Jupiter, which is the Lord of the seventh house, and it's on Venus, which is a Karaka of the seventh house. So again, this heavy duty Saturn, I think, is really, um, I think the partner here is probably having a more difficult time um, than the Venus person. Um, so it's what I'm getting here. Um, the thing about the moon, the moon is debilitated here. And um, it's also with uh, Rahu. So, um, you know, this could, we're looking at potential mental health issues. And again, since this is the third house of the siblings chart, the third house is siblings. So, siblings of siblings, this gets back to the native. So, there is, you know, again, the Taurus person is, I think, having some you know, difficulties mentally, emotionally, because of this longstanding uh, negative situation. Um, but they're trying to work their way through it, um, do what they can. Uh, da, 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 yeah, okay, Jupiter and Mars. Yeah, so Jupiter and Mars on the 612 axis again. There may be legal issues here. The sun I mentioned, Karga Bhav and Asha. Um, but, you know, Moon is not well-placed. Mars is not well-placed. Um, but actually, Mars, uh, when it gets activated, it's going to aspect into that house uh, where the moon is at. So again, I think some new action will bring some support to the mental-emotional issues um, once they're taken. Um, but for the time being, there's not a lot of action being taken. Um, so, you know, again... 
like the main chart here. Yeah. So uh, again, it's um. I mean, really, I mean, if you look at it, it's a very similar chart to the main chart. Yeah. Okay, so more relationships here. Now we're going to look at children and then parents, grandparents. So the top chart says the Septumtia D7, so children. And, uh, you know, luckily Saturn and Moon are well-placed, so that's great. But Saturn is debilitated, so that's going to bring things down a bit. And uh, that Saturn is in the second house of family communication. So that's where, and you have Saturn and Mercury there, both planets that indicate like a bit of isolation, even if not physical isolation, like kind of mental isolation. So because the parents are dealing with this, if there are children involved, the children might be feeling a little bit distant. Mm -hmm. Um, because of difficult communications with family or just the parents not being as present. Um, and then Mars, uh, well, that's kind of interesting here because Mars actually forms a Kirkabhavanasha because it's in the third uh, house here. So there might be issues with siblings uh, coming up for kids. So the kids might be kind of fighting here um, or issues with siblings, that sort of thing, once we get into the uh, Mars entourage. But, you know, at least the Mahadasha Saturn is well-placed. <clears throat> so that's well, better than being in a negative house. So it's probably not the greatest, but, you know, definitely not the worst. So, but it, again, it didn't seem from the chart, like the main issue with kids. I wasn't really getting that. Um, then the second chart here is Dwadashamsha D12, uh, parents and grandparents. So Saturn well-placed, Moon not well-placed, Mars well-placed. And you'll see as we go through the rest of the charts, there's often the Moon is in a negative house as we go through here. Um, so again, that's the mental-emotional challenge piece, I think, coming from the native chart. But anyway, Saturn's well placed, so that's great because it's the you know main planetary period and it's long. Um, moon though is in a negative house and it's uh, debilitated. So that's not usually what we want to see, but luckily uh, Mars is aspecting there, so it does pull up uh, the moon a bit. The other thing is that the Mars aspecting into its own house is going to help um, uh, decrease any kind of material losses so if the parents are worried about money or something like that. Um, you know, there'll, there'll be some stop, stop gaps there. Um, but this also means that, um, cause the moon is the Lord of the eighth house here. Um, so there can be a worry about chronic illness cause that's what the eighth house represents. It can also be paternal grandparents cause K2 is there. K2 represents paternal grandparents. It could also represent mother, because that's what the moon represents. Um, and also because there's K2 in the 8th house here, there might be some sort of like um, cancer tumor type. And I'm not saying that there actually is one, but there might be some concern here. Because again, uh, from the main chart, the, the uh, there's a lot of energy in the 8th house, uh, which could represent medical issues like uh, with the lower GI, like the colon or prostate, you know, that sort of thing. Also gynecological. Um, so we're kind of seeing that more here. But luckily, at least uh, Saturn, the main Mahadasha is uh, well-placed. But, you know, parents are also worried, looks like. Um, then I looked at education and career, because we had that massive Saturn aspecting into the fourth house and the 10th, uh, you know, from the 10th house. So those two things might be indicated. But, um, Education looked uh, mostly okay here. Um, all the grahas were placed. Um, I think, again, this is mostly worry. Um, I don't think there's actually any real main issue here, but worry, because you can see moon, I circled here, is with Rahu Ketu. So it can be, you know, mental health issues, mood issues, you know, worry, anxiety, depression, that sort of thing. But this is a pretty strong education chart, uh, subchart here. You have uh, Mercury and Jupiter, uh, they're in Paribarchan, and those are the two education planets. And then the Lugnatia, the Amsha Lugnatia, the subchart sub Lugnatia is Mercury. So you're going to have this really strong Mercury. And both of these uh, strong planets are going to be aspecting in the fourth house of education. 
So I think, you know, this might be like more performance anxiety type stuff, like testing anxiety, you know, like uh, worry, somebody who worries about education, although they do well, like this might be like a high achiever type, you know, who, you know, they miss a question or two and then they really, you know, it creates a lot of anxiety for them. And especially if this relates to the needle chart, the eighth house, where I was talking about potentially mobility issues in IBS, uh, you know, that's a classic combination, especially like college age, female, um, overachieving, workaholic type who, you know, usually scores best on the test, but strains themselves internally to it can be perfect and achieve high goals and stuff like that. They tend to have a lot of GI issue, you know, IBS because IBS can be, well, it's kind of a diagnosis by default. Like um, when they can't find anything else that goes on, they usually just lump it at IBS. That's what I've seen in my practice. <laughs> and so there's usually a, like a, a psychological component to that. Um, and usually food combining, uh, food, food uh, habits, not always like food allergies or sensitivities, but food habits, eating habits can be problematic. And also I think um, that kind of personality type can also um, unfortunately get into like um, eating disorders and stuff like that. Because again, that whole worrying need to control and then need to control their worrying and anxiety, like it kind of shows up that way where like the impulse or the instinct is to like to control more. But overall, it looks like education's okay. It's just there might be worry there. And then once Mars rolls around, that sub-period, period comes around, um, Mars is exalted in the fifth house. So that may mean that there's some good counsel that's coming about um, that's going to help with best course of action. If there's a little bit of a worry here, um, which like somebody might step in to help out and uh, help alleviate some of this worry, which would be great. Although it doesn't look like there's any real threat here, uh, just the worrying piece. Um, so the Dwada Shamsha D10, this is career, because we had that mass of Saturn in the 10th house. So Saturn's well placed, um, but it is in Parivartana with Venus. So it is going to bring Saturn into its own house, but in the 8th house. So again, worry, anxiety about career. Uh, moon is in the negative house, but at least it's with a swa, you know, Mercury in its own house. So that's going to help Mer um, Mercury. But again, you can see there's a lot of worry here. So, um, yeah, um, what else do we have here? Moon, swa. So again, there there might be this, like, uh, with the moon in the 12th house with Mercury. I, I think I mentioned in some of my talks, uh, when I see Mercury in its own sign, that can be somebody who's really... Um, uh, inclined towards things like meditation and Buddhism and things like that, like a jnana yoga, path of the mind, uh, spiritual spiritual person. Um, so it looks like this person is, you know, might be on like a little bit of a retreat, you know, again, because again, that also is similar to the uh, main chart of just this person's deep in contemplation, like how do I make things better? Um, uh uh, yeah. Um, and then again, moon is in a negative house, so it could be worries about mom here. Um, and that may be what's on this person's mind and how does the worrying and supporting mom affect the career? You know, if they have to take time off work to help them with appointments or getting to appointments or something like that. Um, aspect Jupiter train education mind oh okay so there is also a parivartana between jupiter and sun here so jupiter coming into the sixth house um so that massive uh, strong saturn is going to aspect onto the mercury and moon so that gives them more of an indication of like spiritualizing like some sort of spiritual type retreat here um and really like retraining the mind and I think, again, this this correlates with what we're seeing in the main chart, where, again, this person, there's some sort of long-standing, you know, negative situation. And this person's really kind of digging deep and trying to plant new, like, seeds of thoughts to support them to, to you, know, um, you know, get through and not only survive, but hopefully thrive. Because that's, you know, that's just the nature of a Rohini person. 
you know, very attractive, art, you know, that's just their vibe, you know, that's their internal vibe and that's how they like to live their life. And so when there's a massive challenge, it's like, how do we get, you know, bits and pieces of that back, right? Um, to, um, because that's what they enjoy and that's what supports them, provides like emotional stability. Um, Mars here. Well, this is interesting. So Mars is well placed, uh, but it's debilitated and it's with Rahu. So it's like, so this can be ambition, but like kind of unusual or erratic. Um, but the thing is, I was thinking this might be intentional. Like if, because uh, Taurus is a fixed Earth sign, so you know that alone is not going to make somebody, um, you know like a big risk taker it's more like slow and steady is the way to go but we did see this rahu mars combination in the 11th house of income of groups and societies of uh risk taking gambling it can be the 11th house and so now when when the mars sub period comes around we're getting this rahu mars you know wild combination in the lugna here um, it can be part of what this person's deciding is maybe they've been playing it too safe. Maybe they've been too conventional and maybe that's, they need to shake things up. So even though it may be like a little bit of a left turn or out of the blue, like this person's like, oh, I'm going to do this. And you're like, whoa, I didn't even know you were thinking about that. You know, it's just, um, there might be kind of some sort of, you know, shake up here, but intentionally so, I think is what I'm getting here. Um, so it's kind of like what I was getting from this is like a new way to move through the world, especially like regarding career. Um, so if they have some kind of unconventional side, maybe they've been downplaying that or putting that on the back burner. Now they're like, you know what? I'm going to like put this first and just go with this because this is what I really want. Like this is what makes me happy as opposed to, you know, the um, safe and steady route. So, um, yeah, so this might be actually uh, intentionally foregoing a conventional approach to a uh, career. All right, and then we're looking at income and assets, because I said money might be at least on the mind here, so let's take a look. The first chart here at the top is the Ekadamsha, the D11 income, and the second chart is the Chaturtamsha D4 assets. So all the planets now really placed. <laughs> So yeah, there's there's a worry here um, again because we have Saturn with Moon, so heaviness on the mind in the third house, and uh, communications here. Um, the thing though is that luckily we have this Swa Jupiter in the mix here with this Saturn and Moon, so that's going to help a bit. I think this is mostly about the shift and change again, worrying about the shift and change. Because again, the Taurus person, if they're used to, you know, steady as it goes, and then they're actually going through a pretty big, you know, shake up or glow up or whatever it is. Um, uh, that's, 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 you know, they're not like an Aries, you know, person where he's just like, yeah, every day I'm doing something new and people kind of expect it of me. It's a different energy. Um, but what I was seeing here was, um, there's some creating of a new stream of income. So the fourth lord, uh, where is it? The fourth lord and the fifth lord. Um, th those are, um, you know, Saturn. So Saturn's going to bring that energy. And the thing is, Saturn and Moon are in a negative house, but the third house is also a house that indicates change. So uh, the tenth house, the fourth house here, fifth. So counseling, fifth house, fourth house, happiness. And with this, you know, again, Swa Jupiter on it, I think this person is really thinking about how do they, you know, create more happiness for themselves in the day to day. Um, also, um, with with Mars here in the twelfth house, twelfth house can not only indicate like losses and stuff, although that'll be mitigated here because Mercury's in its own sign. There can be some losses here, but the 12th house can also indicate like international, like foreign places and stuff like that. So it might be that they might be taking their um, business because the Mars is the Lord of the seventh house here, like online or internationally. So, you know, um, 
Yeah, because uh, let's see, second house and seventh house. Yeah, because the other the other thing is Mars is also the lord of the um, second house of like um, uh, savings. Uh, what else here? Oh, and then um, the moon is the lord of the fourth house of career, and sun is also in this Jupiterian mix, and that's the uh, lord of the eleventh house. So it seems like, again, there's like a big shakeup here in terms of developing new streams of income. So I think, you know, what I was seeing, that that may be why this Taurus person, because they're used to slow and steady, you know, is the way. And now that might be why all that Rahu and Mars energy is in the 11th house, because they're really pushing things here to get this to go. Because, you know, again... This is a big change for their normal way of operating. Um, and then again, the oh, the other thing here is we have Saturn aspecting onto Mars and Mars act, as, aspecting onto Saturn. So again, we're going to get this like workaholic um, engineering, you know, construction energy, <laughs> you know, both ways here. Um, so uh, really rebuilding something, you know, there, there's a new, you know, project under construction here in terms of, again, a building some new stream of income looks like. Then the Chatra Tamsha, let's see. So Saturn's well-placed. That's nice. Um, it's also aspecting into the fourth house. So it's going to be swa there. So the home, that should help protect a home if somebody's worried about that, losing that. Um, Moon and Mars are not well-placed. Again, we have Moon in the twelfth house. Uh, <laughs> we keep seeing that here in the subzodiacs. Um, uh, so uh, let's see. What did I say? So, okay, protect home and car. Oh, the fourth house also represents car. So, so again, the Moon. The moon, this person keeps kind of like you know retreating. They're still in this contemplation energy. They're concerned about losses here. They're concerned about mom here, potentially. The thing, though, is I think it's actually helpful for this person to retreat, even though it may seem like, you know, what are they doing? You know, what kind of actions are they taking? It might be good for this person to retreat because the Lord of the 12th house here is Venus, and Venus is exalted in the 5th house here of council. So I think this person does pretty well when they actually kind of isolate a little bit and take their time to sit and retreat and contemplate. Because again, if they have a moon that's swa in Pusha with Sun and Mars on it in the needle chart, that means that this person's very intuitive. So it just may mean that this person's process to get to their answers, they just need to kind of sit quietly for a little bit to really you know, delve deep, you know, figure out what they need to do for themselves. Especially because if they're taking a new road here, that's like unconventional, at least for them, you know, uh, that's what happens when you do an unconventional thing. You can't, you can't listen to anybody anymore. You have to listen to yourself and, and, and follow your own instincts or intuition or imagination or whatever it is. You can't, because there are going to be a lot of people say, oh, you shouldn't do that or you can't do that or whatever. So, um, oh, what else? Um, so again, we're looking at assets here. Oh, and then this Mars. So we have Mars here in the eighth house, but it's with a swa Mercury. So Mercury's in its own house. And uh, K2, so with Mars and K2, that's a lot of separation energy. But, you know, with this Mercury here, what I was getting here is this person is also sorting through like their assets in terms of like, is this truly an asset? Like, is this worth keeping or... Um, is this actually a liability? Like maybe even a liability, not like even financially a liability, but maybe this is like something that's just like some extra thing I have to think about, clean, categorize, store or whatever, spend en you know, time and energy on, if not like, you know, like, you know, hemorrhaging cash. Um, because again, this, this person's going down a new road. So it, part of it is like, you know, letting go, like offloading stuff that's just not useful anymore or active anymore. That's what I'm seeing here. It could also be like donating to charity um, because we have moon in the 12th house. 12th house can also indicate like losses, not only through, you know, like, uh, you know, you're losing income, income's not coming in, or you have some major bills you weren't expecting, but it can be like a mindful loss here. 
Um, like maybe some of these uh, release of assets and stuff like that will, you can donate to charity and then you can decrease your tax bill or something like that. Like that's kind of what this energy is. So even though moon's in a negative house and Mars is in a negative house, I was seeing here that this person is actually thoughtfully going through um, things to see um, how things can shift. Because if you do need some money to pay like uh, hospital bills or something like that, you know, this wouldn't be a bad way to do it. You know, release some assets you can donate and then it decreases your tax bill or, you know, that sort of thing, depending on, you know, person situation. But um, even though, so again, even though it seems kind of negative here, I wasn't really seeing it as mostly negative. So um, I think the income piece, that's probably, again, uh, that definitely looks more challenging. And I think that's why that person's like scrambling, you know, scrambling, it looks like in the primary chart to uh, pump up the income there. Uh, then I was looking at health because I did mention there's probably some health issues based on what I was seeing in the eighth house. So we have the Tajik Shashtamsha um, D6, that's acute illness at the top, and then the Tajik Ashtamsha D8 for chronic illness in the middle, and the Bamsha D27 for general strength at the bottom here. So let's look at the first one. So uh, all the planets are negatively placed. Uh, so acute illness, yeah, looks like there's issues here. And you can see in this chart, you have Mercury and Mars in the eighth house again. So again, I think motility issues, lower GI urology stuff um, is a possibility. You have moon in the 12th house again. So issues with mom, maybe. Um, you do at least have this Jupiter aspecting into the 12th house. So again, you keep seeing that. So again, uh, in most of these charts, you keep seeing a protection of loss of material um, assets and stuff like that. The other thing is, since we're looking at health here, what I'm seeing, this Jupiter aspect in its own sign. So if mom is in the hospital or getting surgery or something like that, or um, it looks like that's going to go pretty well, um, even if that needs to happen. So um, what else? But, you know, again, Saturn, there's going to be some, you know, it could be that the, you know, the Saturn here also is aspecting on the sun and moon. So, again, this heavy responsibility stuff may be weighing on the sun, which is a general health and vitality. And the Saturn, again, responsibilities and long protracted situation may be, you know, is aspecting on the moon. So, the mind. So... I think just even like the responsibilities involved here are going to be dragging somebody down. And that may be what's kind of um, uh, sparking or contributing to like if they have lower I, uh, GI, IBS type issues going on. Uh, so chronic illness. Um, okay, so Saturn's negatively placed, Moon's negatively placed. <laughs> Um, and then Mars is exalted, so that's good. Um, so again, we're getting Mar uh, Moon in the third house here. We're getting Saturn in the twelfth. So again, it might be this like need to retreat and slow down, you know, and find some balance. Because again, this it looks like this Taurus person is very nurturing and supportive or whatever. But I think through all this, they're needing to find, especially since it's a long term situation. Looks like. They need to figure out how new ways of supporting themselves. So let's see. So yeah, I think once you know, once this person has some time to sit and think about things, once Mars rolls rolls around, that sub period rolls around. Mars is exalted here in the tenth house, and it's going to aspect into the first house, which is going to be in its own sign. So that's going to bring some support uh, to this long-standing situation. Um, but yeah, so this is something that needs to be addressed. Um, then the Bamsha D27 strength. Well, luckily Saturn is positively placed, Mars is positively placed, and it's in its own sign. Um, but the moon is not well placed. So again, moon is in the 12th house, so we keep seeing that. So again, retreat. Um, so part of what this, again, person native might need to do is just take a step back, 
and let their own energy settle, um, find some sort of new way of balancing their responsibilities. Um, you know, maybe just, you know, travel, go off, you know, for a few days just to regain their own sense of balance. Um, and again, uh, issues with mom because we have Saturn aspecting on to moon here and Mercury. So responsibilities weighing heavy on the mind, so responsibilities in this protracted situation weighing heavy on mom. We're seeing the same stuff. Um, but again, once this Mars period rolls around, uh, that's going to bring strength to this D27. So I do see that there's going to be some improvements with health once the moon, uh, Mars period roll, uh, sub period rolls around. So with this Mars in its own house, you know, regaining strength and sense of self. But again, there may be like unconventional uh, counsel here regarding all this uh, because Rahu and Mars, that's going to be an unconventional energy. Uh, it's going to be deep. So you can almost see this top chart here is like deep psychology. Venus is a planet that represents worldly counsel. And then you have Jupiter in the fifth house in its own sign, so spiritual counsel. So again, I do think that it helps this person to kind of, you know, you know, even though the people around them may not understand it, I think it does help this person to take some time away to get in touch uh, with what they need to get in touch with and, and think about things a little differently, really get their mindset, uh, their head, you know, uh, their mindset first, and then they can start, you know, moving forward. Um, you know, in, in a good direction here. Um, yeah, so so things should improve with the Marissa period health wise. And then last we have here the spirituality and religion, because again, that keeps popping up in different ways. Um, we have the Tajik Pancha, Panchamsha D5 for innate spirituality, and then the Vimshamsha D20 for worship. This is kind of more ritualized worship like religion. Um, what I noticed first of all is that the, the, they're kind of similar. Like you have a, they're both Sagittarius rising, and you have Jupiter aspecting into Sagittarius in the first one, and then you have Jupiter in Sagittarius in the second one. So I think this person is very spiritual, and that's part of why they need to. Uh, that's why like retreating and meditating seems to be a big part of their life. Um, yeah. So let's see. Saturn in the first one, Saturn's negative and Mars are negatively placed. Moon is in the ninth house. Um, what I was saying here is that again, there's uh, this is a long standing situation. Um, and they're bringing, this person is bringing their mind, their emotions to the, the ninth house here. The ninth house. Um, can represent spiritual community. So I think this person, and that may also be why in the native chart, there's, um, uh, what is it? There's um, Rahu and Mars uh, involved with the 11th house of clubs, groups, and societies. But actually this chart here, it's kind of swapped. Like moon was in the third house aspecting in the ninth. <clears throat> and then we had sun forming that Karko Bhavanash in the ninth. So we still have sun and moon here in the, it, it, sort of in the same way, like in the ninth house. So uh, vitality and mind, this person is bringing to their spiritual community. And then also here we have, even though Mars is in a negative house, it's swa, it's in its own house with Mercury. So again, initiatives to um, cleanse and clear the mind pretty active there, especially with the Mars period, they're going to probably do even more of this like retreating stuff. Um, and then again, the Saturn, it, there's, there's this worry, you know, the, again, this worry, you know, anxiety, doubt, worry, depression, skepticism going on deep in the mind. But again, I think that the <clears throat> process for this person is to uh, take things to their spiritual community to help them and meditate. And then the Vishamsha here, um, Saturn is in the same place. Moon is in the 12th house again. Um, Mars is in the 11th house. So 
Saturn moon negatively placed. Um, so in this in this way, it's like it's sort of sort of the same, a little bit different. Is like now they're going to take their diff instead of bringing their difficulties because Sun and Moon were both uh, involved with the ninth house spiritual community. Now the worship piece is they're going to bring their uh, health and, and mind on retreat or to temple to church uh, places of worship. So it's kind of the same, actually, both of these charts is what I was seeing. Um, and I think once the Mars period, sub-period starts, they're going to kind of socialize more. So it's kind of this uh, dual thing of of being more intentional, maybe, with like uh, meditating time and, um, you know, but not isolating too much and socializing a bit. So, yeah. Um but you can see here with the Jupiter in its own sign with Ketu and Rahu, uh, whatever form of worship they're involved in, it's probably some sort of unusual or foreign belief system. You know, not not something that's common to where they're where they uh, grew up or where they live. But um, yeah, pretty much the same. Like uh, they're bringing all of this uh, stuff: uh, worry, anxiety, concern. Um, by doing a lot of meditation and also uh, bringing it to their spiritual communities to help them. So, yeah. So, that was uh, the chart for the full moon coming up tomorrow. Um, as always, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate you stopping by and listening to one of my talks. Uh, all of my teaching videos on the subject of Vedic Astrology are my concepts playlist. They can all be found there. If you're interested in an individual birth chart reading, I do those on Zoom. You can email heartlightastroyahoo.com for more information. I do have another YouTube channel, Natural Medicine. Um, it's called, and it involves other topics like Ayurveda and yoga, so other Vedic arts, as well as other paradigms of medicine like homeopathy and naturopathic medicine. And the name of that channel is Nature Source Care. So that's out there too, if that's interesting to you. But as always, I hope this talk. Um, helps you with the own, uh, help you, helps you navigate the energy cycles of your own life. So until the next one, you take care and I will see you soon. Namaste.